Um, just to tell you that this is Alf Barahan. I, I had Alf give this talk already in Maru, about last October, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found it interesting. You know, and it's a few little things that I didn't know about. I don't know everything. <laughs> so people think I do, but I don't. <laughs> anyway, but, <laughs> but anyway, Alf has worked, of course, in the, in the Middle East for, for about 11 years in the Middle East uh, as an economist. And I suppose helping some of the, the what do I call them out there, some of the, 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 how to make money, and how to <laughs> develop tourism in the Middle East. Yeah. So I mean, talk tonight, as you can see, and uh, basically what I was interested in was the Coptic Church. I was very interested in, and was there religion in Ireland before, before St. Patrick? So we'll find out, okay? I've, Okay. 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 Well, as Tony said, uh, we're going to. This is a fairly long talk, so uh, we'll kick off as quickly as possible. I just say, uh, additionally to what Tony said, that my wife Mary is with me here as well. I don't know. Would you want to stand, Mary, and let them see? Yeah, in the in the blue or the purple. Uh, she walked the same walk as I did. Uh, we spent a long time in the Middle East. We'll call it that. I'd rather say the Near East, uh, particularly in Egypt and Syria in uh, Lebanon, Jordan, that kind of part of the world. And as Tony said, uh, it wasn't really there to do anything about this. In fact, I didn't know anything about that when I went there. But, uh, you know, we ran into this story. And what I'm going to share, you, uh, share with you tonight is the story as we found it. And you can draw your own conclusions from that. So that's what I'm, I'm taking to you tonight. Now, I want to point out something that Tony didn't point out, which is that I'm not a historian. I am not a theologian. And I'm not an archaeologist. I'm none of those things. So I'm not an expert in any of those fields. And the, the story I'm sharing with you is really a very personal story. So is that okay? Yeah. And, and if you have any questions and so on, if we have time at the end, we do that. It's pretty warm in here. So, I'm going to ask Ireland the gift of the Nile. So uh, I guess the story, in a sense, for us starts here. And this is something that was found, which not, was found not too far away from where you are here, in a place called Fadden Moor. It's a Psalter, an old Psalter. In 2006, it was found in a Tipperary bog. It's a book of Psalms with an Egyptian-style cover with horn buttons, which you can just about see there, and the binding also, which is very uh, typically Egyptian. And within the cover, within the lining of the cover, you have papyrus, which is from the Nile. So all of this was uh, an amazing find. Uh, at that time, the National Museum made, made this. The, the then director was Pat Wallace. And you can see him here, actually, looking at a special exhibit of the Fadden Moore Psalter, which they have. If anybody goes to the National Museum on a regular basis, they'll find it in there. And uh, he made this statement. He said, and this is fairly uh, um, exaggerated uh, <coughs> statement, but you know that's obviously what he f felt it, it ref reflected. It's the most exciting find in Ireland in the past 250 years. And that was putting it on the level of the Arda Chalice, the Cross of Kong, and many of those things that were found. So you can imagine. But beyond that, then, <coughs> there were further uh, statements coming out of the National Museum uh, in press releases and so on. And here is one of the uh, very interesting ones uh, that I just picked up. Fragments of papyrus were dramatically discovered in the lining of the Egyptian style leather binding. This potentially represents a tangible connection between early Irish Christianity and the Middle Eastern Coptic Church. It's a finding that asks many questions and has confounded some of the accepted theories about the history of early Christianity in Ireland. So this is coming from the National Museum at that time. So it gives you an idea of how significant this find was. And other things are popping up since, because before this, maybe we weren't really looking. We weren't expecting to find anything connected to something like Egypt. But once you're tuned in on that wave band, you start to find other things, and even discover things that were found in the 19th century, which actually were never explained. So this is where it was found, the Fadden Moor. This is, this is a bog, it's a townland in a bog, very close to Burr, between Burr and Terry Glass, right there. So you, you all probably know that place. Now, what is papyrus? Uh, the papyrus is, uh, is, first of all, the name itself is the source of the modern word paper. And it's a mat-like fabric, here you see it here, which is made from the pith, the core of the papyrus uh, reed, which is found in the Nile. And uh, that's what it looks like when it's harvested first. And here what they're doing is they're hammering it into this crisscross pattern here, and ultimately it's put onto this scroll. So that's, that's what papyrus is. That's the kind of thing that was found in the lining of the Fadden Moore Psalter. 
Now, what we're going to cover tonight, uh, I'm sure you all want to know what this is all about, so you're just in time to see the scenario. Uh, Christianity in Ireland before St. Patrick, long before. Now, this is, of course, coming from the side of the Copts. The Coptic, they have this corporate memory, remembering this back to the very beginning of Christianity. In the 4th century, Egyptian Coptic monks brought it, and they did so to escape persecution, and in a sense, to f create a space for themselves, to communicate more clearly and more, let's say, um, directly with their God. The influence in, uh, is still in Ireland, uh, obviously it was, uh, most of it is lost, but you have it in the monastic tradition here in Ireland, you have it within the illuminated manuscripts and the structures, and you see all that as we go through this talk. Then in 313 AD, Constantine, who was the then Roman emperor, he sort of changed the rules of the game, if you like. He was a game changer for Christianity. He made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire, and in so doing, he changed very substantially and profoundly the nature of Christianity. Then Roman Christianity assumed leadership within the Christian world, if you can put it like that, like a kind of corporate takeover. Then there was the parting of the ways, particularly between Roman Christianity and Alexandrian, which was then Egyptian Christianity. That took place, took place in about 451 AD. And then in the 5th century, St. Patrick was sent to Romanize the Irish, a kind of rebranding. The Irish already had a form of Christianity here, but it was at that stage considered heretical to the form that was then in place, so they rebranded it. And then the history of all this was lost, first of all because Islam took over in Egypt, uh, records were destroyed there and here, history was airbrushed and rewritten from a Roman point of view, and then of course there was a language uh, difference. And all of this then was compounded by the Ottoman Empire, which acted as a blocker between the East and the West and didn't allow any communication one way or the other between that for over a thousand years. So all of that uh, blocked uh, that. So that's what we're going to cover. Is that okay? Yeah. There you go. Now, who are the cops? These are not the guys who uh, t uh, catch you for uh, lights on your bikes. Um, we'll tell you who they are in a moment. Uh, and why is Egypt so central to this story? Well, the cops, they are the Egyptian Christians, simply that, no more. They're descendants of the ancient pharaonic Egyptians, and in that sense they're different to the majority of e Egyptians, because the majority of Egyptians today are Islamic, and they come from Arabia, they are Arabs basically, but these people, uh, the Copts in Egypt, claim to have the descendants, the, the, the direct descendancy from uh, the pharaohs and that tradition of, of Egypt. Copt is derived from the Greek word Egyptos, which simply means Egyptian, and Coptic is a language which it has evolved from a, a combination, a fusion if you like, of ancient Egyptian and Greek. Now the interesting thing about the Copts for us here in Ireland is that they have a continuity and corporate memory to the very beginning of Christianity, which in fact no other form of Christianity has. They go right back to the year 40 AD, and we'll talk about that later on. So they have that, that memory going right back to the very beginning of Christianity. And as a result of that, they're able to restore our lost memory of the first four centuries of the Christian era, because they know our history in that period, which we don't any longer know. So they have that in their corporate memory. You'll see that as we go through, through, and that's what makes it fascinating to have contact with these, with these people. Now I just put this up to kind of give you an idea. It's not a geography class we're here for, but just to give you a sense of where we're at and the size of some of these countries and the scale and so on. First thing I want to draw your attention to is of course that we have Egypt here in the bottom right hand corner and it is typically seen as part of what we call the Near East or what I refer to as the Near East. The other thing that's notable is the size of these countries here compared with all of these countries in Europe which are quite small and of course the reason is that this is mostly desert. It's a very large area of desert. So we always identify Egypt as being part of the Near East but we are less inclined to uh, identify Egypt as part of North Africa, which it is. It is part of both. It faces in both directions. And the other thing that's interesting here is that in very many Irish manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, you have terms which talk about the Greeks and Greece, uh, uh, the language Greek and, and, and Greeks. But the point is that the Egyptians at that time, the time we're talking about, the early Christian period, they were under the control of the Greeks and they spoke the Greek language. So very often when we look and read these manuscripts and see these references, it's very likely that the references are actually to Egyptians rather than Greeks. Do you get my point? Okay. So that is just a, a very quick uh, reminder of Egypt where it is. Now we can jump back to early Christian Egypt. 
The first thing you'll notice about early Christian Egypt is Alexandria up here, is the cap. There's no Cairo. This is where Cairo is today, Cairo and the pyramids. Alexandria was set up by Alexander the Great. Uh, that was the time the Greek Greeks took over Egypt, and that was in about 330 BC. So Alexandria was the capital of Egypt from 330 BC until about 640 AD, a thousand years more or less. And in 640 AD, Cairo was established by the Islamic uh, people at that time, so that's an Islamic city, and then it became the capital of, of, of Egypt. So Alexandria was the capital at the time we're talking about. You also notice the Nile, which is really the only part of Egypt which is really habitable. The rest of it is full of desert. You have the Sinai Desert, the Eastern Desert, Western Desert. It's all desert. And the very peculiar demographic situation in Egypt is that you have the Nile, which represents 3% of the land mass, but it has 97% of the population. So it's a very odd kind of country in that way. There are only little pockets, these little oases, throughout the rest of the desert where you have small uh, populations. So as I, as I said, from 331, uh, Alexandria was the capital. There was no Cairo until 641 AD, and then it was an Islamic city. In 70 AD, you had the fall of Jerusalem up here as a result of a Roman siege. And as a result of that, you had Jewish migration. And the migrants from uh, Jerusalem went first and foremost to Antioch, which was uh, north of them. But the majority of them came across the isthmus here uh, between um, you know, what is today Israel and Egypt. They crossed over there to Alexandria. And the reason they did that in large numbers is because there was a very large diaspora of Jews already in Alexandria, in the same way as, for example, Irish people go to the US because we have a large diaspora of Irish people there. So they went there. There were half a million Jews, more or less, at that time, or at least going on that uh, number, in, uh, in and around Alexandria. So that's why they came there. Now, at that time, Egypt was known as the original Holy Land, and the reason it was uh, so known was because of the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt and the establishment of monasticism in the Egyptian desert. And by the way, there were thousands of monasteries in the desert. It wasn't just a few isolated monasteries, and those monasteries were both for men and women, and in many cases, dual mon monasteries where you had men and women in the, in, in the same uh, situation. So that's just a kind of a quick overview of early Christian Egypt, the, area, or the, 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 the timeline and the place we're going to be talking about. Now, um, to zero in a little bit on Alexandria, the capital of Egypt at the time, it was the first Christian city. Most people think of Jerusalem as the first Christian city, but actually the Christians, those who were following Christ in Jerusalem at this time, were in fact Jews. So it was in Alexandria where the, the coinage of the term, of the idea of a separate sect, uh, Christianity, actually emerged. And so the Coptic Church of Alexandria was the first time that Christianity was organized as a religious system. And then the Catechetical School of Alexandria was established in about 100 AD, a kind of equivalent, more or less, a kind of seminary type of situation, if you like, to our Manute here. <laughs> Incidentally, this is St. Mark, who I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, this is a Coptic icon of him, and you can see that it is he, because here is the Mediterranean behind him. There's the lighthouse of Alexandria. This is his little lion, which he's always uh, pictured with, and his fig tree here. So this is St. Mark. Also, Alexandria was the inspiration for Christian monasticism. That's where it, it really kicked off. And the Lighthouse of Alexandria was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, underlining the role of that city as a key city for trade and shipping. And then, of course, the famous Library of Alexandria, where the knowledge, at that time, the knowledge of, of the whole known world was concentrated. So that, was, that was a little bit of Alexandria. Saint Mark, he was one of the four evangelists the writer of the oldest canonical gospel. And that's interesting as well, because that gospel was written, uh, is the one that was written, written at the closest time to the time of Christ, which means, in a way, it's most likely to be you know, accurate in terms of, of, of uh, those events and activities around Christ's life. So he's the writer of the oldest canonical gospel. He's regarded by the cops as the first of their 118 popes. Their current pope is Toadros II, and he claims to be the 118th in direct line from uh, St. Mark. He was, St. Mark was a native of North Africa. Today it's Libya, the area which is Libya. His parents were both Jews, and they lived there in Libya until they were attacked by Berbers. They then fled to Jerusalem where their son met Jesus. St. Mark came to Egypt about 42 AD and was martyred there in 68 AD. So you get the picture. And the cops. When they say that they have a, cor a corporate memory going back to the very beginning of Christianity, they trace their memory back to this period here, 40 to 42 AD, direct line. 
This is ancient Alexandria, and the reason I put it up there is to give you a sense of how organized a city it was at that very early day. It was laid out on an isthmus. This is a freshwater lake, Lake Marriott here, and this is the Mediterranean Ocean here, the Gulf of, of, of uh, Alexandria. And it's an isthmus in between, but it's laid out on a very elaborate sort of grid pattern. Uh, any town planner of today, of the 21st century, would be very pleased to have a city like that to, to show for their, their work. <laughs> Limerick, yes, Limerick is a candidate for this. <laughs> anyway, that's ancient Alexandria. It was a hub for trade, commerce, ideas, and religion. Some other little bit. The population at that time of the inner city, this part of the city, was 500,000. This is in the first century AD. You're welcome. So, uh, I mentioned earlier on the uh, lighthouse of Alexandria. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was uh, about 400 feet tall. You could see the light from this lighthouse uh, up to 50 miles out into the Mediterranean. It was a beacon for shipping. At that time, Alexandria was a crossroads for shipping uh, in, in the old world. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is to give you a sense and a context from which the Copts emerged, Coptic Christians emerged. Another uh, overview of the city, just to give you again that sense of how sophisticated it was. Here you see the grid pattern, you see these wonderful villas that they had. They had running water, they had sewage systems, they had an aqueduct running out to uh, one of the islands here, they had a race course here, they had a fresh water canal running into Lake Mario. So a very sophisticated, great place to live, high quality life in those days. World's largest city, the crossroads of east-west trade, the cultural city, etc. of the ancient world. Now the Library of Alexandria, here you have a depiction of it. It was a very organized place as well. You had the scrolls, we said the ones that were most frequently used here on the shelves with somebody retrieving them and scholars consulting them here. But then the more precious research type scrolls were held in amphora jars, large earthenware jars, further back in the library. And they would be maintained there as a kind of air conditioning, a way of cooling those uh, scrolls and keeping them in good condition. These are the most frequently uh, consulted ones. There were over 700,000, some people say 900,000 of these papyrus scrolls that I showed you earlier on in here. There's not one left. Even There's only a small fragment of one in Austria left. That's all. It's all gone. So with that went the knowledge of the, the, of the world. And it was along these lines that they had uh, collected uh, the knowledge of the known world. Uh, religion, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, mechanics, medicine, trade and shipping, and map making. And, in, and when it comes to map making, one of the first maps that it showed Ireland, Ptolemy's map, was actually made in that uh, a library. He was, he, was, he was a scholar there at the time when he made it. And the, the input, the material for putting together that map was coming from the um, records of ship's captains who uh, traveled through and transited through Alexandria and left records of their voyages there in that library. So it was a kind of a, a reference library, an early form of reference library. If you like. <coughs> So as a result of that, the Copts, the Egyptian Christians, they knew quite a bit about the world around them, including Ireland, from that airy stage. Now the other thing about that uh, library in Alexandria is that it was a kind of center of thought leadership. So many scholars there from so many di different parts of uh, what was either the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire at the time. And so it was a center of thought leadership. And it was the genesis of new religions and the layering of religion. These were all the religions that were feeding into that there, and, and not all of them, but some of them. Mesopotamian, Pharaonic, Phoenician, Persian, Greek, Roman, and Judaism. All of those religions were converging at that point. And it was out of that mix that Christianity emerged. So that is really where the genesis of the whole Christian uh, idea. This is Ptolemy's map of Ireland. Uh, it was made about 100 AD in the Alexandria Library. It's based on the voyage records of maritime traders from around 500 BC and perhaps much earlier than that. And this is Ptolemy himself here, Claudius, a uh, graphic of him. And you can see if you look at it, obviously uh, longitude and latitude were not known in those days, but he made a fairly decent effort at uh, uh, creating or depicting um, the, the country. And indeed, if you look here, I've put some of the names beside some of the places that appear on that map, and you'll see that the islands, the ports, and rivers, which you would imagine for, for traders and so on, uh, would be important. They are quite well known. Many of them are marked there. The Boyne, uh, Belfast Lock, uh, Isle of Man, the Ban, uh, the Erne, the Shannon, uh, the Lee, the Barrow. They're all marked there, the Slaney. 
and some other uh, places inland. For example, Aon Mocha is, is marked there, Rath Prahan is marked, uh, Tara is marked, Ishnak is marked, and there's a couple of other places where uh, there, there are doubts about what they represent. But anyway, this is the kind of map that was available at that time. Now Tacitus, who was a Roman historian from 98 AD, uh, he was in, in, in Britain at that time, but of course they didn't, the Romans didn't come to Ireland. But he wrote uh, about the experiences they were having in, in, in Britain, and he wrote a little bit about Ireland. And he said that waters and harbours of Ireland, through means of commerce and navigation, were better known than those of Britain. So that gives you an idea of how unisolated Ireland was in those days. You see, what you have to think about is the fact that nowadays we travel uh, overland because there are bridges, there are roadways, there are means of doing that. But there was very little means of traveling overland in those times. So the route that was chosen always was the sea, coastal navigation and island hopping and so on. And if you had cargoes and so on, that was the only effective, efficient, economic way to travel. So it was the sea. And therefore, Ireland being on that seaboard, at the Atlantic seaboard, was really on Highway 1 of the world as it was at that time. So very less isolated even than it is today. This is the, some of the trade routes that were uh, current at the time and some of the traders. The great traders of that era were the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. And they basically carried the goods for everybody else, particularly for the Egyptians and for various other empires at the time. These are the kind of routes that they uh, pursued or uh, used around the Mediterranean. And you can see the kind of goods that they were taking, gold and silver, timber, tin, all that kind of stuff. And there were grain out of Egypt and transporting it. Not in direct routes all the way across the Mediterranean, but hopping from one place to another and so on like that. And then through the uh, Straits of Gibraltar into what they had was a way station at Cadiz in uh, southwestern Spain or Iberian Peninsula as it was then. And they had another way station at Galicia in northwest Spain, another one at Brittany, and right up to Ireland. They also came to Cornwall. So uh, this was the kind of routes that they were taking. Now, what was bringing them to, to there? What do you think was their interest in Ireland? Hmm? All that way in, those, in that oh, length of time ago. What do you think? Coffee. Coffee. For cheese. For cheese, somebody said. <laughs> no, it wasn't for cheese. <laughs> this is it. This is it. Uh, it was copper. Uh, sorry, I'll take this over. <laughs> they were after copper. And the reason they were after copper is because to make bronze, you need nine parts copper and one part ten. That was basically it. And in those days, that material, bronze, was really like gold. It was more precious than gold. It was more important to an empire to have access to sources and resources of, of, of a means to make bronze. So the, the roots, the, the tin in particular, and, and copper to a lesser extent, were rare metals in Europe, not like iron, for example. These metals were concentrated along the western seaboard, along the Atlantic facade. That's mostly where they were. They weren't to be had anywhere else. They were to be had in places like Cyprus, but uh, the resources there were running dry because of overusage and so on. So here you had copper, there was tin, tin again in Cornwall, some tin here in Br Brittany, and copper resources in Ireland. So the routes they took were like that, just like that. So what they were after was rare minerals, uh, which were precious and strategic in their day. Ireland for copper, Cornwall for tin. Uh, the ancient copper mines in Ireland are in a place called, well, there are two places in particular have been identified, Ross Island in Kerry and Mount Gabriel in Cork. And those uh, mines were operational from about 2000 BC. So they were running for a very long time. And the result was that uh, sea roads, or at least routes for traders, were created all along the Atlantic fringe. And here is where the copper mines were uh, concentrated. This is a Bronze Age shipwreck. It's an underwater archaeologist examining a Phoenician shipwreck. And on board that shipwreck, they found copper ingots like this. These are the actual semi-processed uh, material that they're taking back to the Mediterranean with them. And these are the kind of places that they found those shipwrecks all the way along this route. And there are many others. I've just put in a few there. But the most uh, closest one to us is one up here, which is off the coast of Devon. That's the most that, uh, that has been excavated so far. But there are many, many more to be found. It looks very preserved. Well preserved, doesn't it? Uh, I think that one was in very good condition, yeah. That's, uh, that one, was, I think, was found in the Mediterranean itself. The ones out here are much worse condition because much, uh, we'll say, rougher waters and things like that. 
Meanwhile, back at the Roman Empire, what was happening to the Christians? Well, here are the poor Christians. You can see the persecution of the Christians there in the Colosseum or something like that. And then uh, you can see that uh, here's, this is actually a mosaic, an actual physical mosaic from the time that was in a house in a villa. And uh, you can see how, how, how horrific the persecution really was. The worst of the persecution against the Christians was in the period of Diocletian. He was the then emperor from about 303 to 311 AD. So that was a really, really bad period. So as a result of that, uh, partly as a result of that, but other reasons came into it as well, the Egyptians started to seek uh, places in the desert uh, to create this idea of monasticism and so on. So they moved sort of away from the influence of the Romans, if you like. And uh, after a while, the, there was a kind of log jam in the, in the desert. There were so many uh, monks, men and women there, so many monasteries and so on. They had to seek other places. And they were looking for places outside of the reach of the Romans. And they found this place, which they regarded as a desert in the sea. This place is a desert in the sand, but the, the other place was a desert in the sea. And if you think about it, I mean, being on this island here is almost as bad as being down here because you can't drink salt water. So if you're on the periphery of an island like this, it's almost the same thing as being right in the middle of the desert. So it was a desert in the sea. And the reason for that, seeking these remote places outside the Roman Empire, was to escape persecution and to practice their faith. Surprise, surprise. <coughs> now, we come to Constantine, the game changer. This is him here. 312 to 337 were the dates of his uh, <coughs> of when he was uh, an emperor and uh, he made Christianity the official religion of the empire basically his idea was he was trying to create a glue to keep a, a, a very far flung empire together <coughs> it was very difficult with all the different cultures and different languages and so on to find a common denominator for the, 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 the empire so he felt that a single religion would be the answer. So that was his, his idea. Eventually, he became uh, nominally baptized uh, just uh, as he was dying and so on. But he remained really committed to his pagan uh, form of religion right through his career virtually, or at least he, he had a foot in both camps. So really, religion wasn't a committed thing for him. It was a means to an end. As I said here, a useful tool to control the far-flung Roman Empire, a universal church for a universal empire. And that's where we got this whole idea of the Roman Catholic sort of concept. So that's, that's the guy who started that off. And, but however, in spite of his best efforts, uh, there was still chaos and infighting between various Christian sects. So it was very troublesome even then. So as a result of that, he called something called the Council of Nicaea. And there he is depicted in the center with the bishops all around them. He basically was the one who was driving the ship at that side at that time. This is actually the Nicene Creed here in front of them. So uh, he basically knocked heads together. He told the bishops, go into that room and don't come out until you've hammered out a standard version of Christianity that we can all buy into. Because you, you see the problem. You see the problem he was faced with. So that's what happened. So uniformity emerged and order was restored as a result of that. However, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, which is about 100 years later, Rome and Alexandria split. And they split over almost semantics. They split over the nature of Christ. One claimed, uh, the, the, we say the Roman side claimed that Christ had two natures uh, in one person, whereas the, the Coptic people claimed that it was uh, one nature which was divine and, and human. So it's a semantic kind of thing. It means almost nothing, but that's what they split over. So as a result of this, anyway, we ended up with one religion and two strands. We had the Constantine Roman uh, Christianity, which turned out to be hierarchical, clerical, and institutional. And on the other side, you had Egyptian Christianity, which was Judeo-Christian, spiritual, and scriptural. Very different. And how that played out, you'll see here, early Irish Christians had a different way of organizing co communities to Christians on the continent. Their models were from Egypt and the East, not Europe. Roman Christians had little interest in wild places outside the empire like Ireland. And in the years before St. Patrick, it was the Copts who mainly brought Christianity to Ireland. However, seeing the spread of Coptic Christianity here, Rome became concerned. Roman Christianity was imperial, hierarchical, congregational, political, and conformist, a kind of religion of empire. Whereas early Irish Christianity was nature-centric, monastic, local, intensely personal, and spiritual, a religion of creation. 
So two very different brands of Christianity. And here you see an example of how that uh, concept of the religion of empire played out. This is a depiction uh, in a, the church of Santa Cudenza in Rome from 420 AD. It's a mosaic. It's uh, called Christ Enthroned. But what you see here is that after Constantine, Christ is more emperor than carpenter. And if you just read this caption here, the image of a humble savior has received a Roman makeover. Jesus isn't nailed to the cross like a criminal. He's depicted on a throne like a king or emperor, and his disciples are dressed in the togas of aristocracy. So what was happening there was that Constantine, as an emperor, couldn't imagine that a carpenter's son could be as powerful as him. So when he accepted the notion of Christianity, he had to recreate and rework the image of Christ so that it mirrored more his image as an emperor. So that's where that all came from. In the meantime, this religion of creation, which I mentioned a moment ago, which we followed here in Ireland in that early days, Egyptian, this is uh, actually a, a lady, in fact, uh, rather than even a gentleman, so women were significant in the church at that time as well. Egyptian monks, men and women, and later Irish monks, sought isolation and deprivation in remote places for spiritual communication with nature and God, learning to hear the language of the birds, the animals, the wind and water, and knowing what they say. This form of worship was excessively austere, humble, and intensely spiritual, based on individual devotion. So a very different path was being followed there. So here we have then the origin of monasticism which came out of the Egyptian desert and these were really the founding fathers, the desert fathers. On the left you have St. Anthony of the desert or St. Anthony the Great and on the right you have St. Paul of Thebes. And they're always depicted in this kind of way. I'll explain the significance uh, just briefly. You see here, uh, this is the little Tau scepter of St. Anthony. He's always identified with that. Uh, that is a raven. A raven carried the, a loaf of bread to St. Paul and St. Anthony in the desert on a daily basis, so the legend goes. And when Paul, who was older than Anthony, when he died, there was nobody to bury him except Anthony. So Anthony was helped by these two little lions to bury Paul. So that's the little story, and you see them often depicted like that. This is a, a, a Coptic icon. Early monasticism originated in the 3rd and 4th century in the Egyptian desert among Egyptian Coptic Christians and it came to Ireland from there. And as I mentioned already, it was a form of monasticism which was excessively austere. And you'll see how, how that worked out. It somehow suited us here in Ireland. I don't know whether we're, we're uh, what's the word for, uh, masochistic or whatever, but, but we, it seemed to suit us. So the Coptic footprints then in Ireland, this is really leading up to that. So the lay first thing you notice, the layout of monastic sites. Uh, typically, Irish ancient early monastic sites have no large central church, but several small ones. And these are principally for contemplation and prayer rather than for group congregational uh, service. Typically, there are seven small churches. Seven is a very magic number in the, in the Egyptian context, especially in the Pharaonic context such as at Clindalach, uh, Clonmac Noyes, Inishmore, and others. In the center of every Egyptian monastery was a tower called a car for the call to prayer and to keep precious manuscripts. <laughs> and if you look at, uh, this is a, a modern-day uh, monastery, the monastery of St. Macarius in Wadi Natrun in, in Egypt. You see that, that these characteristics are there with the tower, seven churches, and a cache around the outside. This is an Irish one recreated in Nendrum in County Down. This is uh, the Monastery of St. Catharines in Sinai in Egypt. This is uh, Inish Murray in County Sligo. You see the resemblances here is uh, Glen McNoy's seven churches again, and the same at Glen Glendalough, seven churches. Now, uh, in every Egyptian monastery, there's something called a Coptic bell tower. And you can see an ancient one on the left. And you can see a modern one on the right. So here you have a very ancient one, and they lived off, uh, this was also doubled as a dove cut, so they, the doves would congregate here, and so they would live off, uh, you know, they would kill the doves and live off them, uh, you know, it was also something, to, uh, the doves were significant within their religious tradition as well. So, so that was a dove cut and a bell tower together. Here's a modern one, and here is a fragment of one in Austria left, that's all, it's all gone. So with that went the knowledge of the, the, of the world. And it was along these lines that they had uh, collected uh, the knowledge of the known world. Uh, religion, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, mechanics, medicine, trade and shipping, and map making. 
And, it, and when it comes to map making, one of the first maps that they showed Ireland, Ptolemy's map, was actually made in that uh, a library. He was he was he was a scholar there at the time when he made it, and the the input, the material for putting together that map, was coming from the um, records of ships captains who uh, travelled through and transited through Alexandria and left records of their voyages there in that library. So it was a kind of a, a reference library, an early form of reference library. If you like. <coughs> So as a result of that, the Copts, the Egyptian Christians, they knew quite a bit about the world around them, including Ireland, from that airy stage. Now the other thing about that uh, library in Alexandria is that it was a kind of center of thought leadership. So many scholars there from so many di different parts of uh, what was either the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire at the time. And so it was a center of thought leadership, and it was the genesis of new religions and the layering of religion. These were all the religions that were feeding into that there, and, and not all of them, but some of them. Mesopotamian, Pharaonic, Phoenician, Persian, Greek, Roman, and Judaism. All of those religions were converging at that point. And it was out of that mix that Christianity emerged. So that is really where the genesis of the whole Christian uh, idea. This is Ptolemy's map of Ireland. Uh, it was made about 100 AD in the Alexandria Library. It's based on the voyage records of maritime traders from around 500 BC and perhaps much earlier than that. And this is Ptolemy himself here, Claudius, a uh, graphic of him. And you can see if you look at it, obviously uh, longitude and latitude were not known in those days, but he made a fairly decent effort at uh, uh, creating or depicting um, the, the country. And indeed, if you look here, I've put some of the names beside some of the places that appear on that map, and you'll see that the islands, the ports, and rivers, which you would imagine for, for traders and so on, uh, would be important. They are quite well known. Many of them are marked there. The Boyne, uh, Belfast Lock, uh, Isle of Man, the Ban, uh, the Urn, the Shannon, uh, the Lee, the Barrow. They're all marked there, the Slaney. And some other uh, places inland, for example, Owen Mocha is, is marked there, Rathcrohan is marked, uh, Tara is marked, Ishnuk is marked, and there's a couple of other places where there, there are doubts about what they represent. But anyway, this is the kind of map that was available at that time. Now Tacitus, who was a Roman historian from 98 AD, uh, he was in, in, in Britain at that time, but of course they didn't, the Romans didn't come to Ireland. But he wrote uh, about the experiences they were having in, in, in Britain, and he wrote a little bit about Ireland. And he said that waters and harbours of Ireland, through means of commerce and navigation, were better known than those of Britain. So that gives you an idea of how unisolated Ireland was in those days. You see, what you have to think about is the fact that nowadays we travel uh, overland because there are bridges, there are roadways, there are means of doing that. But there was very little means of traveling overland in those times. So the route that was chosen always was the sea, coastal navigation and island hopping and so on. And if you had cargoes and so on, that was the only effective, efficient economic way to travel. So it was the sea. And therefore, Ireland being on that seaboard, at the Atlantic seaboard, was really on Highway 1 of the world as it was at that time. So very less isolated even than it is today. This is the, some of the trade routes that were uh, current at the time and some of the traders, the great traders of that era were the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. And they basically carried the goods for everybody else, particularly for the Egyptians and for various other empires at the time. These are the kind of routes that they uh, pursued or uh, used around the Mediterranean. And you can see the kind of goods that they were taking, gold and silver, timber, tin, all that kind of stuff. And there were grain out of Egypt and transporting it. Not in direct routes all the way across the Mediterranean, but hopping from one place to another and so on like that. And then through the uh, Straits of Gibraltar into what they had was a way station at Cadiz in uh, southwestern Spain or Iberian Peninsula as it was then. And they had another way station at Galicia in northwest Spain, another one at Brittany, and right up to Ireland. They also came to Cornwall. So uh, this was the kind of routes that they were taking. Now, what was bringing them to, to there? What do you think was their interest in Ireland? Hmm? All that way in, those, in that length of time ago. What do you think? Coffee. Okay. Pochine, somebody said. No, it wasn't Pochine. This is it. This is it. Uh, it was copper. Uh, sorry, I'll take this over. 
They were after copper, and the reason they were after copper is because to make bronze, you need nine parts copper and one part tin. That was basically it. And in those days, that material, bronze, was really like gold. It was more precious than gold. It's more important to an empire to have access to sources and resources of, of, of a means to make bronze. So the, the roots, the, the tin in particular, and, and copper to a lesser extent, were rare metals in Europe, not like iron, for example. These metals were concentrated along the western seaboard, along the Atlantic facade. That's mostly where they were. They weren't to be had anywhere else. They were to be had in places like Cyprus, but uh, the resources there were running dry because of overusage <coughs> and so on. So here you had copper, there was tin, tin again in Cornwall, some tin here in Brit Brittany, and copper resources in Ireland. So the routes they took were like that, just like that. So what they were after was rare minerals, uh, which were precious and strategic in their day. Ireland for copper, Cornwall for tin. Uh, the ancient copper mines in Ireland are in a place called, well, there are two places in particular have been identified, Ross Island in Kerry and Mount Gabriel in Cork. And those uh, mines were operational from about 2000 BC. So they were running for a very long time. And the result was that uh, sea roads, or at least routes for traders, were created all along the Atlantic fringe. And here is where the copper mines were uh, concentrated. This is a Bronze Age shipwreck. It's an underwater archaeologist examining a Phoenician shipwreck. And on board that shipwreck, they found copper ingots like this. These are the actual semi-processed uh, material that they're taking back to the Mediterranean with them. And these are the kind of places that they found those shipwrecks all the way along this route. And there are many others. I've just put in a few there. But the most uh, closest one to us is one up here, which is off the coast of Devon. That's the most that, uh, that has been excavated so far. But there are many, many more to be found. So you just want to preserve. You want to preserve, does not it? Or uh, I think that one was in very good condition, yeah. That's, uh, that one, was, I think, was found in the Mediterranean itself. The ones out here are much worse condition because much, uh, we'll say, rougher waters and things like that. Meanwhile, back at the Roman Empire, what was happening to the Christians? Well, here are the poor Christians. You can see the persecution of the Christians there in the Colosseum or something like that. And then uh, you can see that uh, here's, this is actually a mosaic, an actual physical mosaic from the time that was in a house, in a villa. And uh, you can see how, how, how horrific the persecution really was. The worst of the persecution against the Christians was in the period of Diocletian. He was the then emperor from about 303 to 311 AD. So that was a really, really bad period. So as a result of that, uh, partly as a result of that, but other, other reasons came into it as well, the Egyptians started to seek uh, places in the desert uh, to create this idea of monasticism and so on. So they moved sort of away from the influence of the Romans, if you like. And uh, after a while, the, there was a kind of log jam in the, in the desert. There were so many uh, monks, men and women there, so many monasteries and so on. They had to seek other places. And they were looking for places outside of the reach of the Romans. And they found this place, which they regarded as a desert in the sea. This place is a desert in the sand, but the, the other place was a desert in the sea. And if you think about it, I mean, being on this island here is almost as bad as being down here because you can't drink salt water. So if you're on the periphery of an island like this, it's almost the same thing as being right in the middle of the desert. So it was a desert in the sea. And the reason for that, seeking these remote places outside the Roman Empire, was to escape persecution and to practice their faith. Surprise, surprise. <coughs> now, we come to Constantine, the game changer. This is him here. 312 to 337 were the dates of his uh, <coughs> of when he was uh, an emperor. And uh, he made Christianity the official religion of the empire. Basically, his idea was he was trying to create a glue to keep a, a, a very far-flung empire together. <coughs> it was very difficult with all the different cultures and different languages and so on to find a common denominator for the, 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 the empire. So he felt that a single religion would be the answer. So that was his, his idea. Eventually, he became uh, nominally baptized uh, just uh, as he was dying and so on. But he remained really committed to his pagan uh, form of religion right through his career virtually, or at least he, he had a foot in both camps. So really, religion wasn't a committed thing for him. It was a means to an end. As I said here, a useful tool to control the far-flung Roman Empire, a universal church for a universal empire. And that's where we got this whole idea of the Roman 
Catholic sort of concept. So that's, that's the guy who started that off. And, but however, in spite of his best efforts, uh, there was still chaos and infighting between various Christian sects, so it was very troublesome even then. So as a result of that, he called something called the Council of Nicaea, and there he is depicted in the center with the bishops all around him. He basically was the one who was driving the ship at that, side, at that time. This is actually the Nicene Creed here in front of them. So uh, he basically knocked heads together. He told the bishops, go into that room and don't come out until you've hammered out a standard version of Christianity that we can all buy into. Because you, you see the problem. You see the problem he was faced with. So that's what happened. So uniformity emerged and order was restored as a result of that. However, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, which is about 100 years later, Rome and Alexandria split. And they split over almost semantics. They split over the nature of Christ. One claimed, uh, the, the, we say the Roman side claimed that Christ had two natures uh, in one person, whereas the, the Coptic people claimed that it was uh, one nature which was divine and, and human. So it's a semantic kind of thing. It means almost nothing, but that's what they split over. So as a result of this, anyway, we ended up with one religion and two strands. We had the Constantine Roman uh, Christianity, which turned out to be hierarchical, clerical, and institutional. And on the other side, you had Egyptian Christianity, which was Judeo-Christian, spiritual, and scriptural. Very different. And how that played out, you'll see here, early Irish Christians had a different way of organizing co communities to Christians on the continent. Their models were from Egypt and the East, not Europe. Roman Christians had little interest in wild places outside the empire like Ireland, and in the years before St. Patrick, it was the Copts who mainly brought Christianity to Ireland. However, seeing the spread of Coptic Christianity here, Rome became concerned. Roman Christianity was imperial, hierarchical, congregational, political, and conformist, a kind of religion of empire, whereas early Irish Christianity was nature-centric, monastic, local, intensely personal, and spiritual, a religion of creation. So two very different brands of Christianity. And here you see an example of how that uh, concept of the religion of empire played out. This is a depiction uh, in a, the church of Santa Crudenza in Rome from 420 AD. It's a mosaic. It's uh, called Christ enthroned. But what you see here is that after Constantine, Christ is more emperor than carpenter. And if you just read this caption here, the image of a humble savior has received a Roman makeover. Jesus isn't nailed to the cross like a criminal. He's depicted on a throne like a king or emperor, and his disciples are dressed in the togas of aristocracy. So what was happening there was that Constantine, as an emperor, couldn't imagine that a carpenter's son could be as powerful as him. So when he accepted the notion of Christianity, he had to recreate and rework the image of Christ so that it mirrored more his image as an emperor. So that's where that all came from. In the meantime, this religion of creation, which I mentioned a moment ago, which we followed here in Ireland in that early days, Egyptian, this is uh, actually a, a lady, in fact, uh, rather than even a gentleman, so women were significant in the church at that time as well. Egyptian monks, men and women, and later Irish monks, sought isolation and deprivation in remote places for spiritual communication with nature and God, learning to hear the language of the birds, the animals, the wind and water, and knowing what they say. This form of worship was excessively austere, humble, and intensely spiritual, based on individual devotion. So a very different path was being followed there. So here we have then the origin of monasticism, which came out of the Egyptian desert, and these were really the founding fathers, the desert fathers. On the left you have St. Anthony of the Desert, or St. Anthony the Great, and on the right you have St. Paul of Thebes. And they're always depicted in this kind of way. I'll explain the significance uh, just briefly. You see here, uh, this is the little town scepter of St. Anthony. He's always identified with that. Uh, that is a raven. A raven carried the, a loaf of bread to St. Paul and St. Anthony in the desert on a daily basis, so the legend goes. And when Paul, who was older than Anthony, when he died, there was nobody to bury him except Anthony. So Anthony was helped by these two little lions to bury Paul. So that's the little story, and you see them often depicted like that. This is a, a, a Coptic icon. Early monasticism originated in the 3rd and 4th century in the Egyptian desert among Egyptian Coptic Christians, and it came to Ireland from there. And as I mentioned already, it was a form of monasticism which was excessively austere, and you'll see how, how that worked out 
it somehow suited us here in Ireland. I don't know whether we're, we're uh, what's the word for uh, masochistic or whatever, but, but we, it seemed to suit us. So the Coptic footprints then in Ireland, this is really leading up to that. So the lay, first thing you notice, the layout of monastic sites. Uh, typically, Irish ancient early monastic sites have no large central church, but several small ones. And these are principally for contemplation and prayer rather than for group congregational uh, service. Typically, there are seven small churches. Seven is a very magic number in the, in the Egyptian context, especially in the Pharaonic context, such as at Tlindalah, uh, Clon McNoise, Inishmore, and others. In the center of every Egyptian monastery was a tower called a car for the call to prayer and to keep precious manuscripts. And if you look at, uh, this is a, a modern day uh, monastery, the monastery of St. Macarius in Wadi Natrun in, in Egypt. You see that, that these characteristics are there with the tower, seven churches, and a cashel around the outside. This is an Irish one recreated in Endrum and County Down. This is uh, the monastery of St. Catharines in Sinai in Egypt. This is uh, Inish Murray in County Sligo. You see the resemblances here is uh, Glen McNoise, seven churches again, and the same at Glen Glendalough, seven churches. Now, uh, in every Egyptian monastery, there's something called a Coptic bell tower. And you can see an ancient one on the left, and you can see a modern one on the right. So here you have <coughs> a very ancient one, and they lived off, uh, this is also doubled as a dove cut. So they, the doves would congregate here, and so they would live off, uh, you know, they would kill the doves and live off them. Uh, you know, it was also something, to, uh, the doves were significant within their religious tradition as well. So, so that was a dove coat and a bell tower together. Here's a modern one, and here is one within the oldest monastery in Egypt, which is the monastery of St. Anthony of the Desert, that <coughs> famous man we've spoken about. But then if we come to the Irish version of this, the Irish round tower, uh, there are various stories about this to, to explain it away, but actually it's a very simple thing. The Irish word tells the story completely. The Irish word for this is club chop, and that couldn't say it more plainly. It says a bell house or a bell tower. That's what it was. And so the bells were rung from these four cardinal points as they were here, uh, and they were rung not by pulling a, a rope. They were hand bells, hand bells, which people went up and rang out through those windows. Now the architectural style, on the left you have uh, um, some beehive huts from Skellig Michael in, in Carrick, uh, off the coast of Kerry, but here you have beehive structures in the Egyptian desert. So these are made from mud brick and these are made from stone. And very likely when the cops came to Ireland first, they attempted to build in mud brick, but because of our climate and so on, it didn't work. They probably then went to wood, and that probably rotted too. So ultimately they went to stone. So that's how you got that. But it, it, all the time, the style was preserved, in, including this style up here, which is corbel, what they call corbel roofing, which is not Roman. It's very typically Egyptian. How old did the Egyptian stone? Excuse me? How old did the Egyptian stone? These ones here? Yeah. Yeah, good question. I, I actually don't know. I don't know exactly. Well, no, these would be relatively new because they would have been redone, renewed, and things like that over the, over time. But they would have been built in the same style that had uh, predominated from the start. So they, they would be uh, a mirror image of what was there for... Because in Egypt, one of the amazing things in Egypt is when you go there, it seems like the uh, 2,000 years comes forward to meet you rather than, you you know, going back and it's It's all around you, you know. So it's, it's, time means nothing almost in Egypt. But that, that, that lasts a long time in dry conditions. That lasts a very long time in dry conditions. It's, it goes harder and harder. It's like concrete and so on. Right, thank you. You're right. <coughs> so um, here you see an example of um, the old uh, architectural style. This is a monastery, Bisho Monastery in Wadi Natrun, again in the Egyptian desert. And this has been renewed over time, coming back to your point a bit. Uh, this is the newer part of that monastery, but there's an ancient part of the monastery, and here it is here. And you can see the, those kind of beehive structures. And if you compare that then with this, which is Skellig Michael, you can see the similarities. I think it's, can everybody see that? You all see that? I just go quickly back again, so you see that they're almost a mirror image of one another. Same kind of style. And even today, uh, and again, coming back to your point, that that consistency has been there from the very beginning, over 2,000 years, they've carried it right through. And here it is in a modern, uh, we'd say, interpretation. This is a Coptic monastery, a modern Coptic monastery in Alexandria, with the very same style there. 
Then, uh, here in Ireland, these beehive, beehive huts are scattered around the, the country. You see them all over the place. There's Dingle, this is the Iron Islands, Inish Murray, and uh, Donegal. I, I'll come back to that in a minute. But these are corbel roofing. You see this? This is where the stones are gradually built, built, and built, and built until you get that. So, and I'm sure that the skill that we have in things uh, like dry stone walls and things like that comes from this kind of tradition that uh, we learned you know, over the generations and so on. So that was, came, came directly from, from Egypt. Uh, and of course, as I said, it's not normal. But I want to draw your attention to Killy Beggs. First of all, the name Killy Beggs is quite interesting because uh, if you go to the Irish, it's Nekelia Bega, which simply means the small cells. So that's what Killy Beggs actually means. And there's a reason for that. And you see it somehow in this coat of arms of, of, the, of, the, of the town. Because even though the coat of arms might be relatively modern, it commemorates some very ancient things. The well, first thing you notice about it is the actual part of the coat of arms is the little cell. You see it there? Yeah. Now, the other, another thing that's re very remarkable about it is this name at the bottom. This is their actual logo, if you like, or the little legend that goes under it. And it says, Santa Catharina, Saint Catherine. Which Saint Catherine are we talking about? Hmm? Anybody have an idea? Saint No. This is St. Catherine of Alexandria. St. <coughs> Catherine who was uh, martyred on the wheel. St. Catherine of the wheel. She was a, um, a noble lady who eventually was, was a martyr for her belief in Christianity and so on. But the way they chose to martyr her was to put her on a wheel of blades. And so she was literally sliced apart. And whenever you attend something like a fireworks display, they'll always have or fre frequently finish up with something like a Catherine wheel. Catherine wheel commemorates St. Catherine of Alexandria. And that St. Catherine of Alexandria, and why is that appearing in, in Killybeg? Well, I'll tell you, this has something to do with it, this next page. Um, the fact is that the tradition in Killybegs is that the cops arrived in Ke a group of cops arrived in Killybegs, and the very first thing they did when they arrived was they created a, a, a kind of church or an oratory under their boat, which they turned upside down. And the next thing they did was they built a shrine to Saint Catherine of Alexandria to give thanks for their safe arrival. And they have commemorated Saint Catherine in Killybegs of Alexandria since then. And in fact, Saint Catherine of Alexandria is commemorated in many places in Ireland, believe it or not. But anyway, this is back to this. So this is Galarus in, in the Dingle Peninsula in, in County Kerry. And what it is, as you can see, it's basically the inspiration for it is an upturned boat. So this is a developed concept for what the cops came. They came, they upturned their boats, they lived there. Sometimes they lived in old Neolithic, um, you know, court cairns and things like that, whatever they could find. They were very humble people, but eventually their disciples, Irish disciples probably, and maybe they themselves as well, built structures like this and they got more developed over time. So this is an upturned boat idea, first oratory or shelter, small in size, uh, very typical four meters by three meters, corbel roofing, this is the corbel roofing again, and the word gallerous is very interesting because it simply means the house or shelter of the foreigners. So that more or less tells the story right there. The Irish language is very important in, in getting to the root of these things. And the date is possibly sixth century or later. So that's gallerous, and that's the sort of thing that went on at Killy Beggs. Now we come to the church buildings uh, associated with the cops. Uh, I wouldn't really call them church buildings as such. They're more like oratories or prayer houses. But in any event, we don't have any of them, or hardly any of them left, because originally they were either mud brick or wood, and they have all disappeared, or they were destroyed. Uh, but we do have representations of the stone versions of them, because some of them were made in stone. And here's one. This is at the top of a high cross. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you all with me so far? Have I lost yeah. anybody? Yeah. Okay. Now, what this tells you here is that this is a very small church. It was so small that there are three people standing here. You see that there? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the gable, there are two. So this could hold a maximum of six people, no more. So it clearly wasn't a congregational church. And this is from St. Muradex Cross in Monster Boys, Boys in County Loud. So it's there for you to see. And the name is also uh, quite significant because this is referred to as a dirtchok. And a dirtchok means oak house. Now, why an oak house? It's clearly not an oak house, it's stone. It's oak house because when the cops came, they followed the Druidic tradition that was going on here of celebrating their uh, services and so on in oak groves. And eventually, when the Druids 
maybe abandon those. Uh, the crops used perhaps some of the oak from those oak groves to make their first churches and then later stone. So that's where their chalk comes from. Now in contrast, you see this type of building. This is the Cistercian Abbey, the remains of it, in Boyle in County Roscommon. This is the footprint of that building there. And you see it's a very different kind of structure altogether, huge structure. The inspiration for this is obviously something like that. I think that's a monastery from Cluny in France, but in any event, it's a French monastery of the 12th century. And there were none of these things in Ireland. There were no large churches before the Normans. European religious orders and large congregational churches followed. So a complete different, complete break with the earlier form of Christianity at that time. The organization of the church was different as well. It was all, the Irish church was organized around the abbot as opposed to a bishop. Early Roman Christians chose to model the church on the Roman Empire. And like the empire, the church then came to be ruled by a hierarchy. The early Irish church did not follow this model. And here you see a medieval Roman bishop. But you see here, the Irish equivalents who were abbots. It is an abbot from Moyville in Donegal and from Clonard here. And you see their equivalent today. If you look at this man, this is a picture my Mary took of a Coptic monk in Alexandria. And you look at the style of dress that he has. It's very much in line with these people more than, for example, with that kind of style. Now, the other thing is the Irish abbot, the Irish word, or this word that we use, abbot, is more Coptic than Roman. The word abbot comes from the Coptic word abba, which simply means father. Now, croziers and tau scepters. Here on the left, you see a Roman crozier, very typical kind of uh, staff of a bishop and so on. But on the right, you see St. Anthony of the Desert with his scepter, which was a tau scepter. You see it right there. But then many of the Irish saints are represented with the very same uh, scepter, this tau scepter. Here's one of them, St. Columba. But here is a very familiar saint to us all, St. Bridget, represented with the same tau scepter. You see it there? <coughs> now, tau crosses. What are tau crosses, first of all? Tau crosses are ancient. They originated with the Egyptians and the Sumerians, going back to about 2000 BC, so way before Christianity. They're a sign of immortality, of life, and of healing. And they were probably the earliest form of the cross that was adopted in Christianity. They were adopted by, that cross was adopted by Saint Anthony of the Egyptian desert when he started the trend of monasticism. Also, it is used after, after him as a sign of an abbot in the tradition of St. Anthony. And unfortunately, most traces of this cross have been swept away in Ireland. However, there are some left, and here we see a, few, a couple of representations. On the Doherty Cross in Kilfenora, we clearly see a tau scepter there beside a Latin, uh, more Latin type of, of crozier. You see it there. Can you all see those? Mm -hmm. Is the detail showing up at the back? Yeah? Mm -hmm. You all see it? And here you have a Tau cross in Torrey Island, an early Coptic symbol, which is a sign of the authority of an abbot. But there are others. Two men swearing on a Tau cross in Dysert O.D. High Cross. You see it there? Here is one, the Tau, a tau cross, a rather famous one, and more famous ones we have left in Ireland from County Clare. This is one from outside Dublin. It's ruinous. Uh, nobody has no, most people think that these are broken crosses, Latin crosses. They don't realize that they're a form in themselves. So they leave a thing like that uh, either deliberately or accidentally aside and don't uh, take any care of it. But here's an interesting one. This is a Tau cross from County Kerry. And what I want to draw your attention to especially is this. What's that? Hmm? Exactly. That's a Latin cross. So what is happening here is one form of Christianity is trying to supersede or impress itself on an earlier form of Christianity. Right there, you can see it in, in front of you. It, it actually brings it to life. Is there any connection between uh, the town Tau and the letter T? There is. Yeah, absolutely. The Greek letter. It, there is. And uh, we'll come back to that at the yeah. end, if I may. Yeah. You even have them, in, in some of the talks that I've given in different places, people have come in with photographs of these things that nobody knew about on the mountainside or whatever. And here are a couple that came in from Mayo. This is Killeen in County Mayo. People hadn't understood what this was, didn't know what it was, uh, somebody brought it in. This is Addy Mass in County Mayo, remote places. Tau crosses are sometimes mistaken for broken Latin crosses, as I, as I just mentioned to you very well. Now, in Ireland, the Tau cross was celebrated by the monks themselves because they actually played. Remember I said that uh, the form of uh, monasticism that came to Ireland, that Egyptian form, was excessively uh, severe and, and ascetic. Well, here's an example of it here. 
This is a monk praying in the Tau Cross shape. If you were to hold your hands in that position for about five minutes, you'd still be pretty tired. Here is a, um, a representation of St. Kevin of Glendalough, and he is praying in that position. In fact, this is taken from just outside Knock uh, Basilica. They have it there. It's a sculpture. But he has, as you can see, in his hand a bird. And so what they're saying here is that this man held his hands in such a, in such a position for such a long time that a bird nested in his hands. <laughs> Not only that, but uh, this, by the way, is known as the crux vigilia. That's the term that's used for it. Praying for hours with arms outstretched in the form of a cross, Egyptian in origin, practiced by St. Pacomius and his followers from the 4th century. But the severity of this, sometimes this was done in ice-cold streams. This form of severe, extreme asceticism was typical of the Coptic and Irish church, not the Roman church. Now, Tau scepters on high crosses. This is Pope, the current Coptic Pope, uh, Tawadros II, with his Tau scepter, and you can see it there. What's at the top of the scepter there? Hmm? Can anybody see it? No, at the top, right here. Two serpents. Two serpents, somebody said it, yeah. Two snakes or serpents. Okay, we'll come back to what they are and why they're there in a moment. But have we any, uh, we'll say, parallel of that in Ireland? Well, I suggest to you here, this is the Muradex cross in the Oscar voice. If you look on that, this is Christ in the resurrected position. That's the Tau cross, the Tau scepter of uh, Tau Adros II. Here you see, what do you see there? The Tau cross, yes. You see it represented there? And that's not the only case. Here you see it on the Dorno high cross. See the same thing? You all see it? And then our most famous high cross, which is the cross of the scriptures right there in the center, is the same thing again. So, and then we have very few, but there is one uh, actual uh, crozier or scepter from that period, which is in the Kilkenny Museum, and you can see that at the top of it is clearly a Tau cross with this uh, serpent depiction at the top. So what's all this snakeism all about and serpentism and the Egyptians? Well, here you are. These are, this is the, this is the, uh, the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, and I could take any of the others as well, but I just chose him because we all know him. And this is Queen Nefertiti. And what is right at the top of their most prominent position on the top of their head? There is the rearing cobra. You see it? It's a snake. And what is that snake there for? It represented the connection between the gods and the pharaohs. So it was the divine link between the gods and the pharaohs. It was a symbol of divine authority, of resurrection, of wisdom, of protection, of healing, and fertility. <coughs> so again, here is the, uh, the god Serapis, who was a later Egyptian god. He was a kind of uh, hybrid god between the Greeks and the Egyptians. He was always depicted with snakes around his feet, you see them here, and also snakes around his body. This is Serapis being depicted as a healer. So early Christians, the Egyptians in particular, used pagan symbols to signify aspects of their new faith. The serpent made sense for the Copts because of this tradition. And even today, that uh, tradition is echoed in this symbolism here, which is the symbolism associated with modern medicine, where you see the snake circling uh, the, the slave or this flying pole. You see it there? This is a, a cross um, hidden, as I say, in full view up in Antrim. In fact, it's not celebrated at all. It's actually an offense, and somebody told us about it. Mary took the photograph. Uh, this is it here. You can only see the impression on it in certain lighting conditions. We were lucky enough to see that. And this is really what's on it. So what do you make of this here on the right-hand side? Hmm? That's it. This is a crozier here, I mean the Latin type, the Roman type, and this is a Tau cross. But why is one uh, clearly superior to the other? Because this form of Christianity is suppressing that form of Christianity at that time. That's what this stone represents in Ireland. Now the origins of the Celtic cross, we always associate this as something that's very indigenous to Ireland, and indeed it is, and certainly the development of it is. But where did the inspiration for it come from? Well, here you have on the left a Coptic burial pall from the 5th century. Now, look at the dates. The dates are important. You're talking 400 years between the two. So here is uh, a Coptic burial pall from the 5th century. It's in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. Now, what have you got on it? Well, you've got that, which is a circle representing the sun. 
and you've got this, which is the Latin cross, a Roman cross, on top of it. So you have one form of uh, belief, the, 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 the belief in a sun god, being su supplanted by the belief in a, 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 in, in a Christ uh, situation in, 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 in our form of Christianity. So that's what this represents here. And then here you see it obviously developed uh, into a, because originally these crosses were probably made in wood and then eventually they were made in stone. I mean, uh, sculptors would not go directly to this level of, of relief and detail in stone. They would have done that in wood first and when the wood failed, then they would have gone to the bother of doing that kind of high relief work in stone, but not directly into stone. So there were obviously prototype wooden versions of this before uh, when they um, rotted and decayed, they went to stone. Now I want to show you this one. This is Drum Cliff in County Sligo and its high cross. And there's a particular feature on the west side of that, I think it is, and this is it here. What is that? It's a camel. So the question you have to ask yourself, how many of these were roaming around in Sligo in the 6th or 7th century? <laughs> and still somebody had to have seen that creature to put it there. Here is the idea of that area cross I was telling you about. They were probably portable. They were wooden and portable before they were stone. And here's an example. This is a relief from the Heaney High Cross in County Tipperary. And what it seems to be is a, a funeral cortege where you have a deca uh, uh, decapitated a warrior who has been killed, lost his head here, been carried back on a horse and probably a couple of priests or monks before him and some of the family behind him or whatever. But this monk is carrying that portable version of the wooden ring clock cross. You see it there? Actually the high crosses are fantastic if you have time to go around them and find because they're really where a lot of evidence is to be found of, of this history. These are some of the Irish connected monasteries in Egypt. Mary and I have been to most of them. Uh, there are more. There are about 50 monasteries in the desert, but these are the ones that seem to have an Irish. And what they have is they have distant memories of the early links to Ireland. They still survive there. And the way they've kept them alive is because they have litanies of all what they call their martyrs. And they have different forms of martyrdom. Martyrdom, red martyrdom, when people were killed. White martyrdom when they went to the desert. And green martyrdom when they went into exile. So they have all these martyrs uh, commemorated. And when they start with their litanies, it can take them up to three days to recite the litanies of the martyrs. And inside in those litanies are the names of those martyrs who went to Ireland. So they know the names of them and they know that they exist. So they keep them alive in that way. And they're memorized in these, in these monasteries. Now we come to the illuminated manuscripts and the influence of the cops there. The illustrated Coptic uh, Gospels which uh, we, you will see if you go to Egypt, if you see in the, in, in the uh, Coptic Museum there and so on. They resemble the Book of Kells and other Irish manuscripts in a number of very distinct ways, and I'll go through those in a moment. The style seems to have been borrowed by the Irish from manuscripts brought to Ireland by the Egyptian Copts. Irish monks on pilgrimage or studying in the religious school of Alexandria returned with knowledge from the Egyptian church, and all of this led to the flowering of, the Irish, of Irish culture in the island of saints and scholars. So let's take the first of these rubinations, this pattern of dots. You see, here is a page from the Book of Kells. And of course, in those days, every book, if you wanted to give it to somebody, it had to be copied. It, there was no such thing as, as, as uh, you know, publishing and all that kind of thing. You had to copy physically, laboriously copy every, every and every page, every word, and every, every, every graphic like this. So, for example, if you have an expert scribe, it's very easy for him to create, or relatively easy, maybe even challenging for him, to create those kind of very complicated structures. But many monasteries didn't have master scribes. They had average kind of scribes, or even beginner scribes. They still had to make a shot at it. So the answer to this problem was, obviously, if you're not a master scribe, it's very difficult. But if you put a series of dots all along there, all along there, all you have to do is join the dots. So that is rubination. That is joining the dots, if you like pattern of dots, and that was a, a technique that was used by the Egyptians in the old pharaonic tombs. You know the tombs where, of the pharaohs where they had the wonderful um, you know, uh, paintings on the walls and hieroglyphs and so on. That was the technique they used, and the Copts borrowed that technique and used it in their illuminated manuscripts. Decorated capitals, this is a decorated capital here, and gilded letters, gold. I'll come to the carpet pages and interlacing in a moment. Here are some Coptic manuscripts to compare with, uh, obviously they're older, they're, I mean they're much older, this is the 4th century here, whereas the um, Book of Kells is something like the 8th century thereabouts. 
And would you see this technique? If you see the dots, you see them in between the interlacing. So that's the way they're able to make this complicated design, by using those dots. You see that? Can you all see that? Yeah. It's a little bit uh, difficult from maybe at the back to see it, but if you look closely, you see the dots in between. See them in between. And they follow that and go around. Also on this structure here, you see the same thing. This is evidence of the cops using these type of techniques very early. So the question always here is, who inspired whom? Where did the idea come from? This is interlacing. Um, this is, a, again, that Coptic uh, monk that Mary photographed in Alexandria. And you see his little cross here, uh, very uh, complicated or very kind of sophisticated uh, interlacing. But if you look at this cross here, which is called the Fan Mora, cross in County Donegal. You see the very same kind of, you see it there, you see that interlacing that's on that cross. If I do this, you'll see it more clearly. You see that there? Okay. Now there are several other features on this cross which also have an Egyptian echo to them. Up at the top there are two birds. I'll explain what they are in a moment. And further on the back of that there's a Greek inscription uh, and, and two falcons up here. Let me just show you. There are the two falcons. That's not them there. That's my effort to recreate them. The significance of the falcons is the Egyptian god of the sky was Horus. He was the falcon god. So what you're looking at here is a kind of crossover between a kind of form of paganism, a, a, a copticism, and an effort moving in the direction of Christianity generally. So it's a kind of halfway house between one thing and another. So they're keeping a foot in both camps. They're looking after the people who've looked after them for thousands of years, and then they're looking to the people who look after them in the future. That's what's going on here. And in between all of this, you have five sun motifs. Here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four, and one in the center of five. So this is also going back to the earlier sun worship that was prevalent in Ireland. So that's the kind of thing you have in that cross represented. This is interlacing in a combination of stone and wood. Now, obviously, this is a broken cross. All we're left with is the shaft. Uh, this is from Inishkeel Cross from Guibara Bay in County Donegal. So there you have that kind of interlacing, that intricate work. But here is the iron stitch from Connemara, and you can see the same thing. So what could be the relationship, the connection between those two? Well, it looks like this is the connection. There was a strong ancient tradition for wool and linen in Egypt. Traditional elaborate iron patterns appear to have originated from Coptic monks via manuscripts and textiles. Carpet pages, I mentioned those before. Here are two, uh, both from the book of Doro. Uh, it is from the uh, St. Matthew's uh, Gospel there. Uh, the carpet pages, by the way, get their origin from the fact that the early Christians, I mean, all these religions borrow on one another. The early Christians, before uh, Islam, they prayed on prayer mats and bowed down in the same tradition as um, Muslim people do today. The Muslims actually got that from the early Christians. So that's the way they prayed, and they prayed on small mats like that. So eventually, they took the designs, which were quite elaborate on those uh, small prayer mats, and use them to decorate their illuminated manuscripts. So that's the idea of the carpet page where it comes from. Anyway, here's, here are two from the Irish tradition. And if I put this one in, which is a Coptic version, you'll see the similarities. If you look particularly around here, and this kind of stuff work here. See that? See, it's very, very similar. Now, this is a small book in Cuthbert's Gospel. Some years ago, um, it was uh, in the possession of the Jesuits and it was sold to the British Library, but it passed hands for almost 10 million sterling, so <laughs> a lot of money. Now, why did that happen? <coughs> it happened because this is St. Cuthbert's Gospel. It's so small that if you look at it here, it's within somebody's hand. There are the fingers of the hand there and the thumb on the left. You see that there? So it's literally here, the size of the, of the palm. That's the size of it. Its importance is, it's the oldest surviving book in Europe <coughs> in its original format of Coptic binding and so on. That's its significance. Now, the Cadmuk Gospel of 650 AD, an Irish gospel which was brought to Germany, has similar Coptic binding. It was never returned to Ireland, it's still in Germany. So it has similar Coptic binding. But the key point here, the, real, the bottom line of this is, the bindings of other ancient Irish manuscripts, including, for example, the Book of Kells and many of our famous books, may also have been Coptic before the original bindings were renewed. Because what happened was, people renewed the original bindings without having regard to the fact that they were also significant in their own right. 
But book binding has implications of face-to-face -face contact with the cops. You're not going to be able to do that unless you have face-to-face -face contact with somebody who knows how to do it. This is a Coptic binding. Uh, it's a very robust kind of binding. What you've got here is you've got two boards here. You've got quarters, what they call quarters here, with very, very uh, rugged binding there. Something that would last forever, basically. So that's Coptic. However, here you see, see St. Columbanus represented, and he has something in his hand which has a very Coptic look to it. A Coptic, you see there? See there? Now, here's an amazing similarity. On the left, you have something called the Nag Hammadi Library. This is a, a find, a discovery of 50 manuscripts which were discovered in the Egyptian desert in the, in the 1940s. Uh, the desert really preserves things very, very, very much. Unfortunately, we don't have that climate here, and the bog does preserve some things, but maybe not to the same degree. Anyway, the Fadmore Psalter bears a very close resemblance to these, as you can see there. Now, fading illumination. There are many question marks that come up out of this, and I certainly don't have the answers to all of them. But I share the questions that are in my mind with you, and you can draw your own conclusions. See if you can come up with an answer to it. Here's one. This is the Book of Kells from the 7th, 7th, 8th centuries uh, uh, AD. And this is the Gospel of St. Mark, uh, Armagh, 1138, 12th century. You can see that this is sumptuously uh, decorated. You see that? Yeah? Very, very uh, elaborate. But this is very plain by comparison. So what's going on here? Well, prior to the 8th or 9th century, Irish manuscripts were brilliantly illuminated. From the 10th century on, this brilliance gradually seems to fade out. Could this be due to the cessation of Coptic migration and influence in Ireland? It's a question. I don't know the answer. <coughs> handbells. This is a handbell, uh, an ancient handbell in very good condition at Bangor Monastery in County Down. And on this stone here, Achilles Lee stone, which was probably a pre-Christian stone, it had, uh, that's not a very Christian uh, image that's there on the front of it. But on the side, there's something very interesting. It's been inscribed, re-inscribed with a Christian uh, uh, image. And you'll see there a little monk with his hand bell. If I do that, you'll see it more plainly. Do you see that? That's what's on the side of it. So these were the, ha uh, because they were rung so many times a day from the top of the towers and so on, they were the, literally the heartbeat of the monastery. Uh, they were pioneered by the cops, they were adopted by the Irish, they were used for the call to prayer from bell towers, they were also used in services, in blessings, in curses, in dispensing justice, and to regulate monastery life in its, in its entirety. And then they were spread by the Irish to Europe, kind of completing the circle, if you like. Here are some Egyptian handbells, I'm not going to go through them all, but they're, I draw your attention especially to these here, the very old, 4th century BC, but you see the style, some of them very similar to the style of handbell that we had here in Ireland. The point here, the really important point is, in the early Irish and Egyptian church, handbells had a prominent role, but bells are unknown in Latin churches until the 9th century, 980. <coughs> These are Irish monks on various depictions, White Island, um, County Donegal, Kilcullen, and so on. But all of them have their little handbells, and there they are there. Do you see them? They all have them. Okay? You all with me so far? Mm -hmm. Right, place names. Well, <coughs> I'm sure you're not very surprised to see that name up there. Dysert, desert, or desert. It's a common place name in Ireland. There are at least 80 instances today, still current. Uh, Irish desert meaning a hermitage, a retreat, a refuge. It derived from Latin <coughs> desertus, which meant an abandoned, solitary place, the desert. Some examples, Dysert O.D., Dysert in County Roscommon, Desert Ganey and Donegal, and so on. And you can add many to that list yourself. Originally, there appears to have been 400, or maybe even more, 400 dicerts and deserts in Ireland when there were only 300, and we won't call them towns, but uh, centres of population in the country. So you can see how significant it was in the past. Here's one that we maybe don't uh, think about so much. It's also a place name. It's also associated with Egypt. Uh, and, and again, it occurs quite frequently in Ireland. It's another place name. Laura, it's Greek, from the Egyptian desert. It originally meant a cluster of cells or caves for hermits connected by a path. The term comes from the Greek for a passageway or an alley. It was an intermediary stage between solitary isolated hermits and a fully integrated monastic community. 
Some examples in Ireland, they may be spelled differently but, and phonetically they sound the same, but they're basically coming from the same root. Laura in Wicklow and Monaghan, Laura in Tipperary, Abbey Laura in Longford, Laura in Kerry, Laura Lake in Leitrim, and many more. And here's the man who originated that, St. Macarius of Egypt. He was the originator of the monastic system called the Laura. Something else out of Egypt, which we probably don't always associate with it. This is Alexandria here, and outside of Alexandria, in the deep desert, you have a place called Kelia here. It's in, uh, in Atria, the desert in Atria there. Now, this is Kelia blown up, this, this square thing here. Kelia is actually, is, is, it means simply the cells. And what you have here is an area of 125 square kilometers where there were 1,600 monastic cells for 5,000 monks in the 3rd to the 5th century. And this has been excavated continuously. So uh, the question is, could it be that the Irish kill, which we always think of as church, as in killy bags, kill more, etc., rather than church, it comes from the Egyptian kelia, meaning cell, rather than church, the number of place names of kill, an indication of the widespread influence of monasticism in Ireland. Tonsure, shaping of the head. This is the Roman tonsure here. This is the Irish tonsure or Eastern tradition tonsure. Here you have the front of head uh, shaving, not the full crown. You see that there? Mm -hmm. Completely different. And here you have it exhibited, St. St. Columba here with that front of head. You see it in so other people as well. This was such a big deal that there was a synod called the Synod of Whitby in 664 AD when the Irish tonsure was banned. Why was it banned? It was seen as a visible expression of independence from Rome. There were other items, just one other item on the agenda. We'll come to it later. But that was, there were one of two items on the agenda. So that was a very big deal. Anyway, if we go back again to St. Matthew, the depiction of St. Matthew in the Book of Doro, clearly he is wearing and depicted of the head of, uh, front of head tonsure. You see it there? If you then go to a Coptic marble and you look at this here, these are almost identical. You see that? Senator Whitby in 664 AD when the Irish tonsure was banned. Why was it banned? It was seen as a visible expression of independence from Rome. There were other items, just one other item on the agenda. We'll come to it later. But that was, there were one of two items on the agenda. So that was a very big deal. Anyway, if we go back again to St. Matthew, the depiction of St. Matthew in the Book of Doro, clearly he is wearing and depicted of the head of, uh, front of head tonsure. You see it there? If you then go to a Coptic marble and you look at this here, these are almost identical. You see that? Front of head. Now, here is a very simple, naive kind of uh, rendition of the same uh, <coughs> thing, which is a, a small copt with the front of head tonsure right there. And here is St. Columbanus at his most famous monastery in France, Luxor, and you see at the top of his head, see the front of head tonsure for him as well. Painted eyelids. Um, what was this all about? Well, here's a contemporary of St. Columbanus. Uh, he was talking about uh, St. Columbanus and his monks arriving in Burgundy in uh, the 6th century. And it's go it, this is the description that was given. About 591, Columbanus and his monks came to Burgundy, their foreheads shaven back to the middle of their skull, eastern tonsure, with long stringing locks, Judaic influence, from the Jew Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, tradition, and painted eyelids, which was clearly an Egyptian influence. Mm -hmm. This is the eyeliner that ancient Egyptians used, coal eyeliner. The purpose of it was to combat the glare of the desert and repel insects, neither of which issues we have any problem with here in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So obviously it came from somewhere else. Here is the origin, the pharaohs, you see what their painted eyelids and so on. Mm -hmm. So why were these guys doing it? The reason probably is that it was a stylistic thing, a kind of fashion thing. They got it from those people who brought Christianity to Ireland and they copied it and carried on with it. So they were still doing it at that time in 591. Now chant. It's said that he who sings once prays twice. Irish monks had their own chant, which is closer to the Coptic chant of Egypt than Roman hymnology. Coptic chant was unaccompanied vocal of Pharaonic origin. The monastery of Bangor in County Down exemplified this chant, and the Fadden Moor Psalter, because it's a psalter and because it's about psalms and singing of psalms, is consistent with that tradition. Where it survives, Shanro singing is believed to come from Auroniath Namana Sanchan Amsha, chanting of the monks in olden times. The Ankh, uh, probably all of you have seen this. The Ankh is known as the key of eternal life. It was the Egyptian pharaohs always had it. They were shown wearing it, carrying it. That's it there. And here it is depicted. 
this is a, a pharaoh with two of them on a, a typical pharaonic pose and here it's being carried in the hand of a pharaoh here you have the Coptic cross, the cross that was adopted, the first cross that was adopted by the Copts, the Egyptian Christians. It was a form of the Yang, form of a kind of Christian cross. Now, do you think we have any of these things in Ireland? Here are some examples. Here's Inishke North, very remote places again, small island off the coast, off, the, off an island, off an island. It's actually off the Belmullet Peninsula, off Mayo. Now it's broken, uh, as you can see, but in fact what you're looking at there is you're looking at that. You see that there? It's broken. When it was first found, it was complete, but it has since been broken. It was found quite a while ago, not preserved, but there it is. Here's another one, which is a bit more uh, clear. Can you see that? My own personal favorite is this one, also coming from Inishkay North. Very hard to see now, but if you look closely, that's what you're seeing there. Can you see that? Okay. And then beyond that, there are others, also in very remote places. This is Mason Island, a very small island in Galway Bay, where you have the Coptic Cross. This is an Inish Moor on the Iron Islands, and very clear depiction of one there. Can you see that? Here's another one, also very clear. It's a drawing because it's eroded and so on now. But this one here is from Inish Murray. And beyond that, there are many others, particularly around Kerry. Some of them have been re-erected upside down and different things. Uh, some of them have been rebranded as own stones, you see it here and so on. But they are originally uh, Coptic uh, crosses. And they're still in use even today. Here is a, a, the grave of a Copt who died in Ireland. He was a, a doctor up in uh, Cavan Hospital. And uh, he happened to be buried actually in Kilmore graveyard in County <coughs> Cavan. And uh, that was what he chose to put over his grave. So you see it there in use even today. This is a flabellum. Now, what's a flabellum? A flabellum is a fan used by the cops during services to keep flies away in the hot desert climate, also used by the pharaohs, but unlikely to have originated in our cool Irish climate. We wouldn't need a thing like that, but still we have it. And it's depicted in the Book of Kells. Here's an original Coptic flabellum, a little bit kind of stylized now and so on. But I want to draw your attention especially to this stone. It's very often referred to as the Marigold Stone of Karen Dunna in County Donegal. And the reason it's called a marigold stone is because probably this design at the bottom here reminds people of something like a marigold. That's not the bit that I'm interested in. This is the bit I'm interested in up here. What you've got here is a Coptic flabellum with two loops for hanging it on the wall there. You see them there? That's what it is. And here in the Book of Kells, you see uh, the Madonna page. And within that page, there are three or four uh, uses of the flabellum. Uh, here is an angel blown up here, and she has a flabellum there. There's another one here, and another one here. What they're doing is fanning away the flies from uh, the Virgin Mary. You know, So again, nothing that we would need here, but the inspiration had to come from somewhere for that. And here is the flabellum in use in the time of the pharaohs. Uh, been used to fan him as he was going on. And the coronation of Pope Pius XI in 1922, they used those things as well at that time. There they are, there and there. This is uh, <coughs> a flabellum which has recently been found, which has been reused. When I say reused, it means that <coughs> you'll see at the end, as we <coughs> come to the end of the talk, that uh, the old uh, early Irish church has been swept away and many of its symbols, structures and so on have been broken down, have been buried or have been reused in odd ways. And here's an example. This is actually a flabellum that was on a carved stone. That's the flabellum there. But it's used as part of a roof. You can see it here in a souterrain in, in County Mayo. So in other words, more recently somebody used it as a kind of a handy lentil in this. And another one, that's it there, another one has been identified during one of the talks that we did up around uh, Mayo Abbey in County Mayo. We found another one of these things lying in a, a closed up uh, church, I think it was. Uh, Mary, was it in the church? It was. <coughs> interesting, <coughs> another interesting feature here are these Coptic tomb shrines, and they seem to occur mostly down in the south area. We don't see many of them up in the, up in, uh, the northwest and that, but they are down here in Kerry and uh, around Cork and Clear, as you can see, they're there. There's several examples of them. Now, what are these things? Okay, look at the little hole that you see in all of them. These are stone shrines for the bones of the first saintly hermits who arrived in these places. And what the hole does, 
It permits the pilgrims to touch the bones of the original saint, you see? And the origin of these things is North Africa and Egypt. And another interesting thing about them is, if you look at this one in particular, there's something on the face of it which gives a story, gives the story away. What is this here? It's a Latin cross, and another attempt at to Romanize this earlier form of Christianity. You see it there? So that's what was going on all the time at that time. And, and, and here is the shrine of St. Monaghan uh, from Bohar in County Offaly. He it was stolen some time ago, but thank, thankfully he got it back. It's a marvelous piece of, it's one of our great treasures, I think. Uh, it's still in Bohar as far as I know. But you can see the inspiration for this. This is the, the side view of it, and this is the front view. And look at this here. One is coming straight from the other. You see that? You see, the inspiration is what I want to uh, encourage you to think about. Where did the inspiration come from? Now, Coptic symbols. Uh, the purpose of Coptic symbols was to communicate in the early days between themselves, the Copts, and to avoid persecution. So typically, they would have it on the inside of the wrist where only they, you would see it if they showed it to you. And even today, a taxi driver in Egypt will, if he's Copt, which typically many of them are, and he's receiving somebody who's coming in from Europe, he will show you that because he'll assume that you're a Christian. And so he'll say, Christy, Christy, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. So that's it there. That's today's version of it. But in the old days, they used peacocks, which was a sign of immortality, snakes, a sign of healing and wisdom, and dolphins, uh, signifying salvation and protection. Now, have we any of these symbols in Ireland? Okay. Here we have the oldest yet excavated Christian site in Ireland. It's a place called Cahir Hillon in Kerry. And uh, it was actually well underground, in fact. They didn't have anything overground. They had to go several feet down, three feet, four feet down, before they actually got the stones. But here are some of the stones that they retrieved from it. Maybe it's not too clear on that, but I want to draw your attention to the engraving on this one in particular. What you have there is a flabellum with a couple of snake features here and a naive peacock at the top. You see that there? There were no peacocks in Ireland until the 18th century. The peacock is a Middle Eastern symbol, originally pre-Christian, and it indicated immortality. And a, a kind of odd feature that you see sometimes around where newly thatched houses are throughout the country. You see this feature at the end of the gable. And clearly it's a depiction, obviously, you know, um, derivative over the many generations and centuries, but it's clearly a representation of a peacock. And this, obviously people who put it there, put it there for luck, they don't really know what its origin maybe is. It's a distant echo in their head that they should do that. And of course it comes back to that very ancient origin of the peacock uh, symbolism here in Ireland. What the archaeologists said about this particular site at Carle Hillon, they said evidence from Carle Hillon indicates that direct contacts with the Mediterranean region constituted a strand of influence on the Christian culture that developed in Munster during the 5th century. And this is from the man who led that excavation, John Sheehan, University College, Cork. Now snakes, uh, we don't think of snakes associated with our form of Christianity here in Ireland these days, but in fact it's very much stitched into it. Here we have the cross of the scriptures in Conor McNoise and County Offaly, and right there, it, right under the arm of the, 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 the ring, uh, and very close to Christ, is the snake emblem. And again in the high cross in Monster Voice. As I said before, snakes are an Egyptian symbol of healing and wisdom. They appear in Irish illuminated manuscripts, on decorated shrines, and other sacred objects. Dolphins. Here you have the Cahoc, which is our earliest Irish manuscript. And you have a decorated capital there with this little feature on it here. And that's it there. It's a kind of naive depiction of a dolphin. Here you have the dolphin stone from Carr Island, again a very remote island. It's a little hard to see because it's eroded, but if I do this, you'll see it more clearly. Do you see there? Mm -hmm. That's what's on that stone there. And these are clearly dolphins, or at least uh, an effigy, if you like, of dolphin. And here's a Coptic altar detail with dolphins on it. So you see that running right through again, the inspiration. Dolphins were a symbol of salvation in the Egyptian Christian tradition. Now in Ireland we have great reverence for the word itself, as had the Copts. So much so that the Copts created a kind of shrine uh, for their, their precious manuscripts. And here is one, a Coptic shrine. There's one in every Coptic church. And here in Ireland we have something called the Comdoc, which is exactly the same thing, a shrine for our precious manuscripts. Again, the inspiration, where did it come from? 
they, these people were doing it way back second, third century. We were doing it much later. But we must have got the idea from there. Now language, Coin Greek. Coin Greek, also known as Alexandrian dialect. The Irish monks were some of the few Christians, other than Greek Christians of the time, that had any proficiency in Coin Greek, something they got from their contact with the Coptic Church. And a linguist talking about this, German linguist, he said, anyone on the continent who knew Greek during the early medieval period was either an Irishman or without question had acquired this knowledge from an Irishman. So a very clear statement. Back to St. Anthony of Egypt. This is him here, uh, the desert. This is his little Tau scepter there, and little scroll of St. Paul here. He was the father of the desert fathers. He's held in high reverence in the early Irish church. He features prominently on high crosses at Kells, Monster Boyce, Kilfenora, Moyne Abbey, Armagh, Arbo, Castledermot, and others. Early monks of Ireland consciously regarded St. Anthony as their ideal and prototype, and of course his Tau cross the Tau Cross is identified with St. Anthony's Cross. This is his Tau Cross there. These are some of the high crosses on which he's depicted, different forms. A and P means uh, St. Anthony and St. Paul. And you see here, this is the raven bringing the bread to Anthony and Paul in the desert and so on. Various depictions here. The point here is that there are 60 extant high crosses. Most feature St. Anthony and St. Paul of the Egyptian desert. In fact, St. Anthony appears so many times, he could be the patron saint of Ireland. And that, of course, brings up another puzzling question, which I certainly don't have the answer to, but I'll share it with you. With St. Patrick such a pervasive influence on the early Irish church, why is he so noticeably absent from our high crosses, especially since they were being put up shortly after his time? On the other hand, St. Anthony and St. Paul are visibly present in many cases in the most elevated position after Christ. Resurrection versus crucifixion. Crucifixion. Here we have the cross of Duro, and here we have Muradek's cross in, in Monastery Boys. Neither of them show the crucified Christ. They both show the resurrected Christ, and in a very particular form, and in a very particular uh, style. Now, what is this style evocative of? Well, again, it's a big question, but for us, having lived in Egypt, Clearly, it is related somehow to this figure. You see the, the, the style that is used by this figure. This is Osiris, uh, the Egyptian pharaonic god. He was the god of afterlife, of resurrection and regeneration. And he was always shown with the Greek, uh, sorry, green features to symbolize nature and new life and so on. So this is Osiris, and he has the flail and uh, the, 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 the crook there. And you see Christ in the same position, holding the same one. Now, weighing of the heart, again from Pharaonic Egypt. This is a little bit complex. I'll explain what's going on here. This is a very old uh, papyrus. It's the papyrus of Ani from Thebes in Egypt from 1275 BC, before Christ. So what have we got going on here? Here we have Anubis, who is the undertaker god with the jackal head. Here we have Math up here with her little feather. She was the god of justice, fair play, if you like. We'll come back to this guy, Amet, in a minute. This is Toth. Toth was the god. He was the ibis-headed god. He was the god of records, keeping records and so on. And he's busy recording something there. This is Horus, the falcon god, a god of the sky, carrying his ankh. You see it there in his hand. And this is Osiris. Uh, the, the, the great god of Egypt. Now what's happening here is, and these are some witnesses that you have uh, of this event. This is the dead person. The person has died and he's been brought into this uh, hall where there's the weighing of the heart ceremony. He's brought in by uh, Anubis. When he comes in here, his heart is placed on one half of the weighing scales and a feather on the other side. If his heart weighs lighter than the feather, he will pass through, be recorded by thought, uh, accompanied by Horus and brought into the presence of Osiris. And there he had the promise of resurrection, of new life afterwards. If, on the other hand, his heart weighs heavier than the feather, uh, he, is, he goes no further. He's given to this guy here, Amet, who is a kind of crocodile god, a kind of gobbler god, and he's made no more of, and he doesn't pass on, and that's the end. So do we have anything like this in Ireland? What do you think? 
Well, here on the high cross of Monaster Boyce, we have the very same notion of this scales and the weighing and so on going on right there. And here is the, let's say, uh, the, the inspiration for it. This is Archangel Michael holding the scales of judgment. And in the scales of judgment, you have the poor little soul that's hoping for the best. You have the devil over here trying to pull down the other scales and get him down, whereas he's hoping for the best of all. It, it, it appears that either Egyptian Christians adopted the theme and Irish monks transmitted it, or Irish monks replaced Osiris with Christ and changed the theme of Anubis and Toth to St. Michael and Satan. The Egyptian origin seems clear. Resurrection. This is something called the opening of the mouth ceremony. It was essential to Egyptians to have life to, after death. What's going on here is this is the dead person mummified. This is Anubis, the undertaker god. This is the dead person's tomb here, and this is his headstone. See it there? In front of them you have ladies who are keening, exactly in the same way as we have the keeners here in Ireland. They are professional keeners, they're not part of the family. And behind them you have priests, and the priests of an altar on which there's offerings here. This man has an incense burner, and these men have a, 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 an instrument that they're going to open the mouth of the dead person with. And down here you have something a little bit more macabre going on. You have a cow and her calf. You have two acolytes here running along to an altar with an offering. And you notice that the calf has only three legs. So the question is, where is his fourth leg? And his fourth leg is here being carried to be put on that altar. So that's a bit more macabre. But anyway, the opening of the mouth ceremony was essential because the Egyptians believed that the soul emerged from the mouth. And that was the only way you could have life after death. So this is what's going on here. They're drawing out the soul with this instrument here, opening the mouth, and then allowing him to have life afterwards. And then when the soul left the body, it was the, in Egyptian it was called the Ba, represented always by a bird. The bird sometimes floated, very often floated, over the dead person, went away and came back later on and so on. But it reminds us a little bit of the idea of the Holy Spirit and so on, which uh, we have in Christianity. Anyway, do we have any of this kind of thing in Ireland? Well, again, this is Tom McNoise, a panel from uh, High Cross, Cross of the Scriptures of Tom McNoise, and this is the Cross of Doro. And both of them have the same panel. And you see here, what you see is, you see Christ lying in the tomb here. That's Christ there in the yellow. And on top of him, there's a heavy stone. And these are the two Roman soldiers who are supposed to be guarding the tomb. And of course, there's nothing much going on, so they've fallen asleep. Over here you see the same thing, Christ lying in the tomb, the stone over it, and you see the two soldiers asleep. This bit is broken, unfortunately. But the bit that I especially want to bring your attention to is this little bit of blue, and over here too. Because what you have here is a bird flying into the mouth of Christ. So, in the resurrection panels of high crosses at Tonmec Noise in Duro, birds are showing flying or breathing into the mouth of Christ. The arrival of the bird signifies the return of the soul and the moment of resurrection. The origin of this bird soul is Egypt. The Ba symbolized the power of the dead to roam the earth again and was often depicted flying above the corpse. You follow me? Okay. This is the Ba, this time depicted in human form, with a human head as opposed to a bird head again, hovering over the, the uh, mummy, the mummified remains of the Egyptian dead person. And here's a motif from an Egyptian pharaonic tomb. Now, do we have this particular motif in Ireland? Well, here is something called the Brat Madoc, which is St. Mog's Shrine from the 9th century. And what I want to draw your attention to is the penguin-like figures, both bird, with both bird and human heads, in between these uh, chiefs or whoever they are. And it's this, if this will work, you see them here. This is with a bird head, this is with the human head, another bird head. See that there? So it's the very same idea as the bird head and human head for these. So what does this symbolize? Uh, symbolize? Well, again, I don't know myself, but what I think is happening here is these were famous chieftains, and they're depicted on this shrine. And what they're saying is that we have the souls of our ancestors all around us, and they are guiding us every day, and we are living with them. Now, this is Termin Feck in High Cross, and what I want to uh, draw your attention to here is the figure above Christ on this, this figure here. Look at it and compare it to those. It's a Baal-like figure above Christ. You see that? Deviant burials. In County Roscommon, close to where we come from, skeletons were found in Loch Key around 2011. First, they thought they were associated with the Black Death. 
Some of them were, but they found that many of them, quite a few of them, were from a much earlier period, around seven or 800 years earlier than that, and they were different. And the big difference was that they, many of them were buried in this form. So can you all see that at the back? What you're looking at here, that's a skeleton. That's the skull there. And then this is the mouth here. And you have, what have you got? You've got a stone in the mouth, and they were buried like that. So these are referred to by the archaeologists as deviant burials. They're dating from the 8th century. It's believed individuals were buried this way to stop evil spirits rising from the dead to haunt the living. We had just come back from Egypt at that time, so the very first thought that came into our heads was, it brought to mind the Egyptian opening of the Mount Ceremony. And we, the question that was in our heads, and again, we don't have the answer, but the question is, could it be the medieval Irish were aware of the Egyptian ritual and were trying to stop the soul or spirit leaving the body? You get me? Mm -hmm. Just to tell you that it wasn't all one way traffic in those ancient times. Here you had also Irish monks studying at the Catechological School of Alexandria. Early Irish pilgrims visited the monastery of St. Mina up near Alexandria. There's a guidebook for Irish monks traveling to Egypt uh, to visit the Desert Fathers and detailing the pyramids. It's now located in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And holy water bot bottles have been found in Ireland and in Cork carrying the twin camel emblem associated with the shrine of St. Mina from west of, of Alexandria. Here is St. Mina. He's always depicted in this way with two little camels there. And this is the flask that was found in Cork. One of them, many of them have been found actually. And you see the figure there with two bowing camels, one on each side. See that there? Irish place names also appear to relate to St. Mina. You have Kilmina in County Mayo, and you have Ballymina in County Antrim. Now, written references uh, to the cops in Ireland. There's a known uh, inscription on a stone near St. Olin's Holy Well in County Cork, and it reads, Pray for Olin the Egyptian. Handwriting in the margin by a monk working on the famous book of Doro in 650 AD, it states very clearly and unequivocally, Egyptus my, I'm an Egyptian. That was a gloss in the side of the, of the manuscript. A manuscript of the monastery of Bangor, County Down, 680 to 691 AD, declares, this house, full of delight, is built on the rock and indeed the true vine transplanted out of Egypt. And in the very same manuscript, there are 19 other references to Egypt. This is a very direct and clear one again. This is uh, from an Irish litany from the 8th century, and it says, seven monks of Egypt in Desertoli. Desertoli is up by Loch Ney in, in Northern Ireland. In Desertoli, I invoke unto my aid through Jesus Christ. And those seven monks of Egypt are depicted on a high cross as Ahini in County Tipperary. A letter to Charlemagne in 782 by the English scholar monk Alcun described the Irish Christians as Pueri Egyptaki, children of the Egyptians. The oldest extant Irish missal, the Stowe Missal, mentions Egyptian hermits of the 4th century and gives a prominent position to the Egyptian desert fathers. And finally, Salter and Iran, Irish or 11th or 12th century edition of the Book of Adam and Eve, composed in Egypt in the 5th and 6th century, is known in no other European country except Ireland at that time. So spiritual highways, obviously the seas and the rivers were the way that people got around. Uh, you can see that the center of Ireland was very different, it was like an inland sea at that time. Uh, this is how they moved around. They only needed a small amount of water to move and then they could carry it on their back where there was land. Uh, places that are bogs now in former times were watered and the monastery ruins of it was right in the center of what is an island today, <coughs> like that. Voluntary exile, here you have a plaque that is set up at Teelan Pier in County Donegal by the Icelanders, some people from Iceland, and they commemorate on this plaque uh, Irish monks, cops, Egyptians and Irish combination going to Iceland in the 5th century. It was a form of martyrdom practiced by the cops, this wandering without direction or plan, a form of, of green martyrdom. And this is what it says on the plaque, wording on the plaque, in memory of the Thielen monks who sailed to Iceland in the 5th century, written in Irish, English, and Icelandic. This is the kind of wandering those early monks did. There were, there were records of them in many of these places. For example, here you have the pharaohs, a recent pharaohese stamp depicting Irish monks on the island, and then the widespread missionary activity in mainland followed. Coptic saints revered in Ireland, probably more than you'd imagine. St. Anthony, uh, St. Paul of Thebes, St. Catherine, I mentioned, the seven monks of Desertoli, St. Mark in Armagh, St. Mina in Mayo, St. Pacomius, 
Athanasius, St. Thomas on the Iron Island, and St. Roland in Cork. Mm -hmm. This is St. Catherine with her little wheel, and here she is depicted in one of our ancient ruinous uh, monasteries with her little wheel there. Now, Irish saints recognized by the Vatican. Does anybody know how many there are? No. How many would you think? No. None. So <laughs> no, there are a few. There are just four. Just four. And these are the St. Malachi, St. Lawrence O'Toole, St. Oliver Plunkett, St. Charles of Mount Argus. And none of them come from the period that we're talking about. None of them. And the most amazing thing of all, there are almost 200 recognized by the local church. And finally, no St. Patrick. No St. Patrick. So who are these four men that are recognized by the Vatican and why? Here they are. St. Malachi, Lawrence O'Toole, Oliver Plunkett, and St. Charles of Mount and why were they recognized? Well, here's St. Malachi. He was the first Irish saint canonized. He led the 12th century reform of the Irish church. So that's why he got his stripes. St. Lawrence O'Toole is from a very similar period. He was also had a prominent role in the Irish church reform of the 12th century. St. Oliver Plunkett, he's a more, uh, if you like, deserving case almost. And he was the last Roman Catholic martyr to die in England. And this man, he's actually not Irish. He's Dutch. He's a Dutch passionate priest known for miraculous healing. So then we come to reform and St. Patrick. I'm not going to say a lot about this. You know most about it yourselves. I certainly don't deny St. Uh, Patrick's uh, presence here, but I think that he was, uh, my story is really adding to it and completing his, the, the whole story. He was on a different mission. He was basically rebranding Christianity. He helped cover the tracks of the Egyptians. The shamrock, which we associate so much with him, is actually an Arabic word. You see it there? That's the word it comes from. Shamrock wasn't used until about the 15th century, 16th century. Um, over here you see the snakes. We can imagine who they might be now. There were no snakes living in Ireland. Much too cold for snakes. Real snakes. Over here you have the kind of, uh, we said the movement of St. Patrick, which was mostly in the upper part of the country. There's Cashel down here. We certainly there. It may have been in a few other places, but mostly up here. Why was that? It was probably because of this, the, the ancient copper mines, because the tradition of people coming from the Mediterranean was more down around this area, and so this area was more likely to be taken territory, and this was more virgin territory for him to work in. But then, after St. Patrick, we had the famous synod of Whitby in 664. What was this all about? Well, the Irish were in Scotland. They were moving down with their form of Christianity. And in the south, you had uh, St. Augustine sent over by the Pope uh, to try and uh, really, if you like, resist this movement by the Irish and that form of Christianity through uh, Britain. So he was uh, first Roman Archbishop of Canterbury. He was coming up from the south, evangelizing from there. So there had to be a meeting of minds somewhere. So eventually they called a council here at Whitby to try and sort this out. The men at, at Whitby, there were two items on the agenda, the Irish Easter and the Irish Tonsure. I mentioned it before. Both were Eastern. Unfortunately, the Irish lost the day on that day, and St. August, uh, Augustine prevailed. So the Irish had to retreat, and things changed. It, uh, I, that was the beginning of the end of the early Irish church, in a way. Irish church at that point was clearly not Roman at this time, despite the efforts of St. Patrick. So if St. Patrick's mission was so successful, why would there have been a need for Whitby? So clearly... Was the Irish Easter? Was that the The date of Easter. It was an Easter date that they were using, and not the, the Roman date. And then the other question that follows quickly on from that, if not from Rome, then where did early Irish Christianity come from? So these are questions you can ask yourself. So full Romanization then happened in the 12th century. And of course, you had a collusion between this Pope, who was Pope Adrian IV, who was British, the only British Pope, and Henry II, who was Franco-British. He was actually a French king who uh, became the king of England as well. So these two were working together, church and state. Pope Adrian granted uh, authority to Henry II to effect the conquest of Ireland for the enlarging of the bounds of the church. And this is the papal bull that was uh, used for that. This is proof from a sitting pope that Ireland was not part of the Roman church before 1172. As a result of that, we ended up with the Normans, with dioceses here in Ireland, uh, the European religious orders, uh, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Augustinians, and all of them, a, a completely different form of monasticism. And then, of course, the demise of the early Irish monastic church. 
This is the face of the early uh, church. Here you see a high cross fragment found under the plaster of Drumcliff uh, Church of Ireland Church in County Slide. We see it there. Here is another piece. And the indication, it's a huge, uh, the scale of this, the indication of a massive scale of the broken high cross is possibly twice as big as the cross that's still standing at, at Drumcliff. Another piece of the same cross under the plaster of that wall. So, after the Normans, they had a different vision about Ireland with the idea of land closure, private property, and towns. The 12th century, the Irish church reform took place, and as a result, uh, the early church, monastic church, was suppressed. Uh, the early church was then superseded by European monastic orders, and then there was destruction, abandonment, and reuse of structures and symbols, and you've seen that already. And the sad outcome of all of this was that memory was lost and forgotten, or Romanized. So fast forward then to today, and what we see, full circle, the Copts in Ireland again. First Coptic papal visit to Ireland in May 2017. Here you see Tawadros II meeting Archbishop Kieran Martin. Current status in Egypt and Ireland, 50 monasteries in Egypt, Copts. 14 million Copts among 96 million Egyptians, very much in the minority. And they're struggling for their very existence and Christian existence in that country. There are about 500 cops in Ireland, but they have small churches in Dublin, Bray, Galway, Care, and Delvin, and also at Hedford. And the one at Hedford is particularly significant, I think, because the title of the Hedford Church is the Monastery of the Seven Coptic Monks, where they commemorate those seven Coptic monks that came to Deeser Valley all that time ago. Sadly, back in Egypt, this is the reality that they face. This is a Coptic nun. This is a bomb explosion on Palm Sunday, 2017, 29 killed, 47 injured. Uh, it was, sadly, it was the Coptic Cathedral of St. Mark in Cairo. And there are many other instances like that going on all the time. What was the motive? It's, the, it's, it's uh, driven by uh, an effort to create a division between Islam and Christianity in, in Egypt. Divisive. So why it's come, not come to light before? Well, I believe it did, but it was written out, airbrushed from history. The history of early Irish Christianity was written from a Roman viewpoint. There was suppression of pagan history by patricians. Early records were destroyed by the patricians in Ireland, by the Vikings, and by the Arabs in Egypt. There was Coptic suppression in Egypt, which was crowded out by uh, Muslim majority. And uh, the Copts were lost for a thousand years until rediscovered by the French. Official Egypt favored Muslim over Christian history, and political correctness connects Ireland with Europe rather than the Mediterranean. The last word from a Copt. Irish monasticism preserved the heritage of the ancient world and rebuilt the West after the barbarian invasions of Rome. And if the Irish church is the daughter of the Egyptian church, then the West owes more to Egypt than most would imagine. And then St. Patrick said, the law of God was well planted in Ireland days of old, and he did not wish to take credit for the work of this predecessor. So there I am walking the walk, and this is the story that I discovered, and I thank you all for your attention. From that time on, you know, uh, that, that, was, that was basically heresy, because Dunn 451 at the Council of Chalcedon, and the reason they split was over the nature of Christ, they too, you know, uh, the divine scene is very significant, there, and that drove a wedge, and what then happened was the Roman church kind of developed in its own way.